It all depends on his context. Hello there everyone, this is Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, and today I'm here with a review of The Power and the Glory by Graham Greene. This is a literary fiction novel set in Mexico in the 1930s, when Mexico was a communist place, and it's specifically set during the Red Shirt Revolution, where God is outlawed, and we're following a Catholic priest. But before we dive further into the novel, let's just talk about Graham Greene for a second, because he is known for a certain kind of fiction. Generally, his his works are called Catholic fiction. Green spent a lot of time traveling as a journalist and he traveled to places that he thought might make good settings for his novels and he did a whole bunch of research in those settings. Several of his finest novels are set in developing nations on the edge of political revolutions or upheavals or the brink of war. His stories often explore moral ambiguities set against this political backdrop of contemporary politics. In the case of The Power and the Glory, we're following a rather weak and alcoholic priest as he's trying to flee the communist authorities who are trying to track him down and jail him or kill him. His antagonist is a very ambitious lieutenant in the Mexican police who wants to completely eliminate Catholicism from Mexico because of its excesses and abuses, namely the sexual and monetary favors required by some of the priesthood. Because antagonists define protagonists, let's take a closer look at this antagonist so that our protagonist, the priest, comes into better view. So the antagonist, when he's looking at a group of young children in the square, he wants to like show off his gun and promote the idea that, oh, we're your friends, you want to be like us political authorities. And he says, it was for these he was fighting. He would eliminate from their childhood everything which had made him miserable. All that was poor, superstitious, and corrupt. They deserved nothing less than the truth a vacant universe and a cooling world, the right to be happy in any way they chose. So that's kind of what he's fighting for, as opposed to essentially the lies and corruption of the church, which is pretty much all he thinks there is to the church. And he's willing to sacrifice lives to that ideal. He wants to create a new world for these young people to grow up in, a desert in his words. The priestly protagonist, on the other hand, now freely admits that he used to be among those proud and haughty priests who couldn't really relate to the poor people of Mexico. But by the time we meet him, he's a broken and humbled man. He's wandering around, nobody wants to accept him into their village because they could get killed just for sheltering him. So his flush of pride has long passed. Oh God, forgive me. I am a proud, lustful, and greedy man. I have loved authority too much. These people are martyrs, protecting me with their own lives. They deserve a martyr to care for them, not a man like me, who loves all the wrong things. Perhaps I had better escape. If I tell people how it is over here, perhaps they will send a good man with a fire of love. As usual, his self-confession dwindled away into the practical problem. What am I to do? As the only priest left in Mexico, that's what he continually asks himself. Should I stay? Should I go? Is it better for the people if I stay here and offer them confessions, even though I'm offering them a very poor example of what it means to live a holy life? He's what is known as a whiskey priest, which is a priest who drinks a lot. He also has fathered a child, and we get more into his motivations for that near the end of the book, so I don't want to spoil them. So he knows that his soul is in mortal peril because of his fornication with a woman. And that's another reason why he's kind of considering, yeah, I kind of want to get out of here. I need to go find a priest to whom I can make a confession before I'm killed because my soul is in mortal peril. Silence by Shusako Endo covers some of the same themes here. Does it make you a coward if you flee? Does it mean that you're a martyr or a hero if you stay and face persecution? And who are the real martyrs in this situation? You priests or the people who are dying in protection of you. Both silence and the power and the glory cover some of that same complex moral ground. Moral ambiguity engendered by political persecution. Both books show how though we are weak and broken, Christ's strength can show through. And although neither novel excuses the failures of the priests, each does show God working through these very human humans. But in contrast to silence, which is really very bleak in style, and in storytelling, the power and the glory is very rich. I really enjoyed reading it, whereas Silence, I was 
kind of struggling through it. I wanted to understand what it was telling me, but I wasn't enjoying the experience. I very much enjoyed The Power and the Glory, though. It's got colorful characters, multiple perspectives. You're not just following the priest. You see it from multiple points of view. It opens from the point of view of a dentist, and there's a lot of humor in there involving the dentist because, you know, there's no painkillers and stuff, so kind of grim humor. And the language is just beautiful. Every other line, I was just thinking, holy cow, this is gorgeous. I want to sit down and reread it all again. It also alludes to a lot of biblical verses to kind of strengthen its descriptions in humorous ways. There's one woman who is met in prison for having holy books in her home, whereas this priest, he's very worried for this pious woman because so often pious people are not charitable to other people. In his description of her later when she's sleeping with her mouth open, like, she has strong teeth like tombs, which is obviously a reference to when Jesus calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. I feel like if I sat down and reread this book immediately, I would enjoy it even more than I did the first time. I finished this in two days, which is unheard of for me. I did listen to an audiobook at some points, and it was a beautiful audiobook, beautifully narrated. And don't worry, I was checking with the ebook anytime there was confusion about what was going on. I followed things very well. I feel like though there's so much more here that I could just dig into again and again and I, I would love to like, do some more in-depth study on this book but I'll probably just read some other books by Graham Greene and come back to this one in the future. This one could potentially be one of my top 10 from the year. It's so complex and human and beautiful and it conveys that message that I heartily approve of which is that where spirituality meets humanity it's often not a pious and clean affair. It's not always simple. This book does not withdraw from the dirt and the pain and the bad decisions that are often involved in such a meeting. Now I'm going to move on to the spoilery section of this video so if you don't want to see that you'll want to just head out here in a second but I just wanted to say if you enjoyed this video please do give me a thumbs up in the corner and subscribe to this channel if you want to see more videos from me and hit that little bell icon if you want to be notified anytime I make a new video and I hope you'll grab a copy of this book okay take care guys and come back when you've read the book and watch the spoilery section and chat with me I would love to chat about this book Thanks guys, bye bye. Okay, spoilers. The priest in The Power and the Glory continually circles back to the same areas in Mexico, just as he's circling away from safety and back into danger. And the draw for that is always when somebody calls out to him. He's always pursuing people who are in need and he doesn't turn back from them even when he suspects it's a trap or it's just not true, which in both cases where it really matters where he could have escaped, he was not really needed in either case. But he went anyway. That I think is really the admirable thing about him and I think that's what makes him a hero. He walked into death with his eyes wide open. Even though he was terrified, he was not a courageous man in the sense of his feelings, he walked into death anyway, which is a courageous move. But he had such a strong sense of his own sinfulness and humility and I honestly I think that was a good thing for him because for a short period of the novel he actually reaches freedom and he has a false victory moment and this period actually shows him as he probably was during the cushier times of his years as a priest. He starts charging for baptisms and he uses all of that money to go buy some whiskey mm -hmm. or was it brandy? Some kind of alcohol. I don't know because I don't drink. There's probably some symbolic significance in the different kinds of alcohol that he uses. Regardless, he loads up on that alcohol and starts to head off to a safe part of Mexico, the big city, if you will, where he could live in comfort and everybody is just fawning over him as the priest in town. And you just know that this is how he used to act. He says that he stayed in Mexico because of his pride. This novel does explore the theme of pride and he thinks that's pretty much why he stayed in Mexico and that's why he ended up falling into alcoholism, into neglecting his prayers and other responsibilities. He's the kind of guy that if he lives in modern day America, he might get into some trouble because he has the potential for sleeping around and getting drunk and neglecting his duties. I mean, that's just not somebody you want to be your priest unless there's somebody watching it over him and making sure that he's adhering to the rules. But again, God has put him in this place in Mexico for a reason, that's my interpretation. It's because he cannot handle life as a priest in a cushier state. The danger in Mexico has actually allowed him to 
become something greater than he would be in an easier life. So that version of the priest contrasts sharply with the version of the priest that we see through most of the book. That's just a little glimpse of what he used to be and is no longer, as long as he's in the right context. It all depends on his context. So I thought it was really interesting when he is on the edge of freedom and he's called back to somebody's deathbed. It's not just anybody's deathbed. It's the gringo murderer that we've been hearing about through this whole book. And he's not just called back by anybody. He's called back by the Judas figure in this book with the two fangs, which I thought was another great biblical illusion. He's a snake. This Judas figure just keeps popping up at the worst moments for this poor priest. Or the best moments, depending on how you look at it. So he gets summoned to another deathbed and heads back, fully expecting that this action will lead to his death which it does. I think it's really appropriate that this priest remains unnamed because that's a very humble position to be in and he requires humble circumstances to keep himself humble. And in fact, he has absolutely no ego by the end of the story. Listen to this. It doesn't matter so much my being a coward and all the rest. I can put God into a man's mouth just the same and I can give him God's pardon. It wouldn't make any difference to that if every priest in the church was like me. Again, this is the God works through broken people thing. <laughs> he can work through anybody. It's a mystery. And although he really doesn't feel like a holy martyr in the end, he does become that for a few select individuals. In one of the most moving scenes of the book, there's a very young boy whom we've had like check-ins with throughout the book. This young boy is listening to a moralistic tale about saints and martyrs that his mom is telling him and two little girls. And the little girls are just enthralled by most of the tale. They completely believe what's happening, that this little boy Juan, it's about, it's about a little boy Juan who just undergoes all of these trials and he's so inspiring all the time and he dies a martyr's death and at his death, the people who killed him just feel so bad about it. And the little boy that we are following, not Juan, the boy who's listening to Juan's story is like, yeah, right. I don't believe any of this. All he cares about is the moment of the gun. That's the only part that gets him interested is when Juan is about to be shot or whoever is about to be killed. Well, it turns out that when our priest is killed in this time and place, that really touches this boy. The boy says that really brings it home to him because he's met this man. The priest had come to their house before. His mom calls the man a hero. And she says, yeah, he was killed by the police. Even though in our introduction to the policeman who does end up killing the priest himself, he's the one who captures the priest and puts him to death. This little boy spits on the gun of the policeman who killed the priest. I love the symbolism there. The boy's kind of like, man, I just, I feel like I missed something. Can we get a relic from this priest guy who just died? And mom's like, well, maybe, you know, it costs money. We might be able to do that. And it just seems like you get the feeling that this boy needs a real live hero. He needs to know a real live person in order to believe in the cause. Well, guess what? He goes to sleep, has a dream, and wakes up suddenly to a knocking on the door and nobody goes to get the door. He's the man of the house at the moment. His dad is not here. So he goes to the door and answers the door and guess who's at the door? It's a priest. The priest announces himself and the boy grabs the priest's hand and kisses it. And that's the end. That's, that's the last image of the story. And I love it. I, I just think that's so wonderful. Such a wonderful moment to leave the story on. Wow. I just feel like that's kind of a triumphant note for our poor unnamed priest. He became a martyr for this boy. He became a hero. And it didn't mean that he had to be perfect. It's because this little boy had met the priest before. So the boy thinks, I've really met this guy. And it just really brings it home to him that now this guy is dead. There's so much more in this book that I did not even, I'm sure, uncover right now. I just, oh man, every line almost, there was something there that I wanted to talk about, but you know, I just can't talk about everything. Please, please read it if it sounds at all interesting to you. Highly recommended. Absolutely loved it. I'm going to have a written review of this on Goodreads because it's just that good. So if you want to, you can check that out and give it a like and friend me on Goodreads or follow me on Goodreads. And uh, yeah, thanks for talking with me, guys. If you want to chat about this in the comments, that would be wonderful. I would love to talk to you. If you have more books that you would recommend to me like this, yeah, I'd love to know about them. Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.